go ahead and be seated together, and as you're seated, you can join me in uh, Romans chapter 12, if you will, the 12th chapter of the book of Romans. God is praiseworthy, isn't He? You're finding Romans all right? The 12th chapter of the book of Romans. Let's take another moment and pray together. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name for your word. Father, it is your word. You've told us we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from your mouth. And Father, <coughs> we turn to you this morning desiring words, the words that you would speak to us, not men's words, not interesting thoughts, not well-turned phrases, but your words, Father, that you would speak to us by your Spirit. And Father, I know that we're different folks. We have different gifts and different callings. We face different circumstances and situations. But you, Father, are a big enough God to speak to each of us by your Spirit, specific, personal, directive words that, that steer us in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake, that correct us, Father, from our deviations, and which encourage us where we've been faint-hearted and, and not stepped out. Thank you, Father, for drawing us again by your Spirit and instructing us with wisdom and revelation so that we know what the next steps are. In Jesus' name, amen. In Romans chapter 12, I'm going to begin reading at verse 1 where it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now these are going to be very familiar verses to many of you, but uh, let's take a moment and look at them, if you will, with fresh eyes. Let's first of all focus on the pivot point between the two where he says, which is your reasonable service. The word that we're translating reasonable there, some translations like your spiritual service, but it, 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 it more closely resembles our English word logical. It's talking about it makes sense. On account of something, this all makes sense. If, we want, if you're saying it doesn't make sense to me, well then we're not taking into account something we need to take into account because when you're seeing what you're supposed to see, this makes sense. It's got quiet out here all of a sudden. God isn't asking you to do something crazy, to do something which doesn't seem right to you. He isn't, he isn't saying, you know, the world talks about leaps of faith, meaning just a blind jump into nothing. But the Bible doesn't talk about leaps of faith. The Bible talks about having your feet planted on the rock. It talks about, be, we're not supposed to just leap off into nothing hoping something will happen. We're supposed to know what we're told to do and, and then understand that when we do it, His promise is that He'll uphold us in it. Are you awake? And, and so this, the, the central point here, or the pivot point, is this sensibility. We have to understand that if it doesn't make sense to me, I'm missing something important. I need to see something more than I'm seeing if this isn't making good sense to me. Are you awake? Now, what is going to make sense to us is that we're supposed to be submitting our bodies as a living sacrifice and not be conformed by the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And as you've heard me say many times, many of you, conformed is a word which describes pressure from the outside. It's talking about being shaped and molded by something else. It's the word that you would use to describe manipulating clay or Play-Doh in your hands. The clay or Play-Doh has no desire or will of its own. It's being adjusted, adapted by me, by an external force, something acting on it. And he's saying, don't let the world act on you as an external force to conform and adapt you to its pattern, but rather be transformed. And the word that we're translating transformed there is related to our English word metamorphosis, and it's the word which we would use to describe what happens when a tadpole becomes a frog or what happens when a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. Something inside drives a transformation which shows up on the outside. And he's saying, don't let what's outside of you push on you so hard that you begin to look the way it wants you to look, 
but let what's God's placed inside of you drive you so hard that you begin to look on the outside like what you are on the inside. How many of you have read that you're going to be clothed with glory? Wouldn't it be cool if we could see some of that here? Well, the point is to be transformed by what's on the inside. We're not supposed to be a treasure chest. Oh, look at my. A treasure chest has great value inside of it. But it generally doesn't look very impressive itself, does it? Because it's a sturdy container which keeps in what it's supposed to keep in. And a lot of people approach this life as though we're supposed to be a treasure chest. Keep the outside clean, keep the, outside, keep, keep the inside clean, keep the outside crusty to protect the inside. Sturdy, armor-plated. Are you here? We're supposed to be something a little more like a lamp where what's inside shines to the outside and demonstrates through the outside to the world around it what in fact is in it. And that's what he's talking about when he says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He's saying there's something which happens when we take the pressure that's around us and push back and take the pressure that's within us and respond and submit. Something changes for the better. Now, in in the beginning of verse 1, he's saying that we're supposed to be submitting our bodies, living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service. Now, we're not talking about, you know, submitting our bodies gives people such strange images sometimes, but it's simply a call to live in service to Him, in honor to Him. And I, I so like to emphasize the word living in this because he doesn't say he wants dead sacrifices. And I spent a long time where the only people I knew who claimed they were serving God looked like they were pretty dead to me. I mean, they were moving around and their eyes were open, but that was about all that would give you an indication there was life happening there. Are you guys awake? I was a long ways into my life before I met people who claimed to know God and be joyful about it. I was a long way into my life before I met people who said they were serving God and it looked like it was blessing them instead of doing them in. I was aware of the culture which suggested that if you really serve God, if you really submit to God, if you really obey God, then you're going to wear burlap and you're going to own nothing and you're going to eat one crust of bread every day and two glasses of water and you're going to subsist on this and, and you're going to just you know, walk through life barefoot and alone. Are we here? Now, whether you take that literally or use it more figuratively, that's something like the image that an awful lot of people have of what it means to serve God. But he says he's looking for living sacrifices. He's, a, he's the God of life who wants to give us life and life more abundantly. And he's looking for living sacrifices, which will testify not through their stoic deadness, but through their life, their joy, that he's alive. Amen? Now, all of that sets us up to, to the direction we're going. We're not going to spend a lot of time here in Romans chapter 12 this morning, but it gives us a perspective which is very important for us to have. But you'll notice he begins by saying, I beseech you, therefore. Now, of course, beseech is a very strong word. We don't beseech much these days. Anybody beseech anybody this week? <laughs> we don't generally use the term beseech, but uh, it's kind of an old-fashioned way of saying pleading with somebody. It, it's talking about, I'm, I'm begging you, please. Do this. Are we here? That's very strong. The Spirit of God speaking through the Apostle Paul is pleading with us to this thing. It's important. What is the basis for this plea? Well, that word therefore tells us that what we just said has something to do with what we're about to say. And in this case, the therefore is talking about the fact that the three previous chapters, chapter 9, 10, and 11 in Romans are all addressing Israel and Israel's historic failure to obey God and fulfill its calling. Are we here? If it's possible for people that have passed through the Red Sea on dry ground, if it's possible for people that have eaten manna in the wilderness, if it's possible for people who have taken possession of a land flowing with milk and honey because the Lord fought their battles for them, if it's possible for a people who has received great deliverances from forces which have rallied around them to try to overwhelm them time and time again, if it's possible for a people like that to be selfish and foolish 
and not fulfill their destiny and not answer God's call, then it's possible for us to do the same. And he says, I beseech you, brethren, please, I'm pleading with you here, don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let your, your body and your soul serve the Lord. Let everything that's in you serve Him because He's worthy of it. Are you awake? It's a call to submit ourselves to Him because without that, we become indistinguishable from the world. And we may see each other in heaven, but there won't be a lot about what happens between here and there that will suggest that there's any difference. And that's not what we've been called to. We've been called apart to something significant. Come with me over to chapter 1 while we're here in Romans. We've been called apart to something significant. It's not for no reason that the Lord has called us. Now, you may have not immediately recognized this, but we're, we're talking in a sense this morning about the clash of cultures here. A simple definition of culture that you've been hearing me use a bit lately is the attitudes and behaviors characteristic of a particular group of people. The attitudes and behaviors characteristic of a particular group of people. The world around us definitely has a culture, attitudes and behaviors that are characteristic. But the kingdom of God has a culture too attitudes and behaviors that are characteristic of the citizens of that kingdom. And if I'm going to live in that kingdom, and if I'm going to operate in that kingdom, I'm going to have to learn something about how the kingdom operates and not simply use the world's culture in the kingdom. That doesn't work out real well. Are we still here? So in, in the first chapter of Romans... Again, the Apostle Paul says at verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. He says, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. First of all, to the religious folks who've been studying these things but have been missing something. And then also to the unreligious folks, the philosophers, the intellectuals, the folks who are all inside their head and worshiping man. That's the contrast. Over and over and again in the New Testament, when we see the Jew and the Greek put side by side, we're not talking about racial and ethnic distinctions. We're talking more about a cultural distinction. There were Jews of many races, but Jewishness was defined by your worship and your training. Are we here? To become a proselyte, you had to be instructed to be accepted into the faith. Are we here? What was the Greek culture? The Greek culture was a very man-centered culture. All about how smart we are and how far we can get with how smart we are. And when the Bible says the Jew and the Greek, it's talking about the religious folks who pray every day, but they're not sure exactly who they're praying to, and the unreligious folks who don't believe there probably even is a God. And he says the gospel is God's power for salvation to all of these folks, to everybody. No matter where you start from, it's the door you're going to pass through. The gospel is God's power. Power. In this particular case, power is the word dunamis, which is that ability-giving power, that miraculous power which works miracles. It's the supernatural, miraculous power of God which gives ability. And it says, the gospel is God's supernatural, miraculous power which gives ability for salvation. It's God's power to save, to make us complete and whole to make us what we were designed to be. Are you still awake? And that's for everyone that believes, no matter where you start from. I don't know, I messed it up pretty badly, Pastor. You can't mess it up so badly that the gospel isn't God's power to salvation for you. Well, you know, the rest of these folks look like they're pretty nice folks, but you have no idea what I've done. It doesn't matter where we start from. The gospel is God's power for salvation. If you thought you were close, 
the gospel is still His power to save you. If you knew you were far, the gospel is still His power to save you. If you were thinking about Him every day, the gospel is His power to save you. If you didn't think about Him at all, the gospel is His power to save you. Are we still here? Gospel is for everybody, not just for some folks. It's for everybody. It's God's good news that in Jesus Christ, all of sin was judged and all the price was paid. And there is forgiveness in Him and redemption. Are we still here? To the Jew first and also to the Greek, therein is God's righteousness revealed. Something supernatural and spiritual takes place. There's a revelation, a pulling off of the covers from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, what I'm getting at is, this is not some joining a club. This is not the way you join the rotary. The Lions Club. We're going to send glasses around the world. I'm not picking on the Lions. It's a good thing. I'm glad they're sending those glasses because somebody needs to do this. And that was a great idea. Whoever came up with that was really thinking. Are we awake? But the point is, to get into the Lions Club, you don't need to pass through a great transformation. You don't need a supernatural power at work in you. If joining the kingdom of God, if stepping out of this world into the kingdom of God requires that transformation, then it sounds to me like we've been called apart to something extraordinary. Something different than normal. Something other than average. Our calling is to be something which is unusual in this earth. Now, it's not that it ought to be unusual, but it is. It's not usual for people to live in fellowship with God. It's not usual for people to walk in obedience to His instructions. It's not usual for people to worship Him in spirit and in truth. You don't encounter that all the time everywhere you go. Have you noticed that? So if we're going to do this thing, it's going to make us a little different. Now, I didn't say it's going to make you weird. I didn't say it's going to make you so that nobody likes you. I said it's going to make you a little different. It's like when, uh, you know, there's, there's places. Uh, when I was a little boy, a guy who became my best friend moved to our town from Columbus, Ohio. I was living in Connecticut. He moved to the town I was growing up in from Columbus, Ohio, just down the block and around the corner from me. And we met him. They had lived in Columbus where they could see the clock tower on Ohio State's football stadium from their house. There were no bigger Ohio State fans to be found. Now let me tell you, Ohio State fans are thin on the ground in West Hartford, Connecticut. <laughs> These guys were like transplants from Mars. Are you hearing me? But it didn't stop them. In fact, their world went on pause on Saturday afternoon when Ohio State was playing on TV. Nothing happened when Ohio State was doing its thing. The Buckeyes. And their dad was the worst of the bunch. He just, he was absolutely Ohio State to the bone. You know what I'm talking about? Now that didn't mean that they couldn't have, you understand, they were a different culture. <laughs> they were a different culture. In New England, you don't find a lot of Ohio State fans, but they lived their culture anyway. Are you awake? And when you walked in their house, you were an Ohio State fan, too. <laughs> Hello? So what's so hard about saying, I live in the kingdom, I serve the kingdom, and if you walk in my house, you don't have to believe what I believe, but you better not 
say what you were just about to say in this house. <laughs> Hello? Oh, now everybody's looking real sober. They don't take down their Ohio State penance when we walk in. They don't hide everything and act embarrassed. Somebody go hang a rag over that bumper sticker. There's people coming who don't root for Ohio State. Hello? Yeah. They proudly wore the fact that in their world they were Buckeyes. <laughs> and I don't have a problem with being identified. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It doesn't bother me to be identified with Jesus. I'll stand up and be counted with him. You don't like Jesus? Well, then you probably don't like me either because I'm on his side. Are we still awake? It's a great calling. It's a huge privilege. In fact, in what we have come to call the Lord's Prayer, Jesus concludes saying to the Father, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The culture of his kingdom, the attitudes and behaviors characteristic of those who are in his kingdom are supposed to be present in his citizens on the earth. Is this an amen moment? Come on with me to Acts chapter 26. Now the world around us, and by the world I'm not so much talking about the people as just the forms and systems of this world, isn't going to decide to leave you alone just because it's ridiculous to pester you. This is uh, campaign season. Have you noticed that? Yes. Any of you getting any mail from somebody that you know you're not voting for? There's three hands. Are you getting any mail from somebody? You know. I mean, it doesn't matter what the thing says. It's just not help. Just, why'd they even send it? Doesn't stop them from sending it, does it? What about if you put a lawn sign out front with somebody with, with their opponent's name on it? Does that stop the mail from coming? Bumper sticker on your car? In fact, there's pretty much nothing you can do to stop the mail from coming, right? Well, the world is like that. It doesn't matter that you've got God's lawn sign on your yard and God's bumper sticker on your car. The world keeps sending you mail. The world doesn't back off just because you say you quit. Are we still here? But the challenge, the call, the thing that we're being pled with concerning in Romans chapter 12 is don't be conformed to the world. Just because they're putting mail in your box doesn't mean you've got to get soft towards them. In Acts chapter 26, Paul is describing the experience of encountering Jesus on his way to Damascus. He's describing it approximately 20 years after it happened to him. And he's stating what Jesus said to him here. And in the midst of it, he's talking about Paul's calling, what he's supposed to do. And he says at the end of verse 17, the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, that's Jesus speaking to Paul, I'm sending you to the Gentiles, verse 18, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Jesus has said, in essence, I'm sending you to the Gentiles to call them to a culture change, to not just adapt and adjust, but to make a radical. They're gonna, when they receive Jesus, their world is going to be shaken. They're coming out of the darkness into the light. They're coming out of Satan's power into God's service. They're coming out of being strangers and aliens from the covenants of God into being joint heirs with Jesus Christ. They're coming out from under the burden of guilt and sin into the world of forgiveness. Do you see that there's this transformation spoken of in verse 18? He's talking about coming a long way. He's not talking about someday ending up in heaven. Yeah. 
He didn't say, Paul, go out there, preach real good. Many of them will smile and nod, and that will mean someday they will be in heaven with me. He said, I'm sending you out there to open their eyes. They need to see. They need to come out of the darkness and into the light. They need to come out of their disenfranchised state and understand that they have been called to be heirs. They need to come out of all of the weight of unforgiveness and into the freedom and joy of forgiveness. They need to not be conformed to this world, but to be transformed. The gospel is God's power to work that transformation. But even as believers, we can choose to be conformed to this world. Romans chapter 12 isn't written to the world. Romans chapter 12 is, is addressed directly to the, the saints, the believers, the church, those who already have their citizenship in the kingdom of God. Those who have already made the change. He says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Get your head to cooperate with what God's already doing in your heart and get your body to quit being a tool of the world system. Come out to the light. Come on with me to Colossians chapter 1. It's, a, it's an impassioned plea. It's a strong call. It's a, it's a very direct statement that our calling is from darkness to light. And once we start into the light, let's stay in the light. You know, <laughs> most of us have had the experience of ad adjusting to light, you know, dark and you turn on the light, it's an uncomfortable experience, isn't it? Now, for most people, most of the time, it's not radically uncomfortable. It's not a horrible experience, a trauma that I don't want to go through again. But it's also not anything you do on purpose. It's got quiet out here. I mean, could you imagine somebody? Just a minute. It's going to take me a minute. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's better. Turn the lights out again. Let's get used to the dark. Oh, yeah, there's the light. Oh, that's amazing. Turn them out again. You know, you think, what's the matter with you? You get used to the light, stay in the light. We got some work to do here. But you know how many believers live their lives like that? Truth shows up and they go, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Just a minute, I'll get it. You want to say, stick with it. Next time it won't be such a surprise. Stay with the light. Stay in the truth. Stay where it is so that it isn't all the time a matter of adjusting. Whoa, truth, revelation. I'm going to have to work on that. Yeah, that's the way we begin, but that's not the way we're supposed to start. <laughs> I mean, stay. There we go where we start, not where we stay. Are we still here? Colossians chapter 1. He says, concerning Jesus Christ, at verse 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and, or excuse me, the Father, I, I meant to say, his strengthened with might. We're back all the way to walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, and the knowledge of God. We come down to verse 13. Who hath delivered us, delivered us, brought us up out of the power of darkness. Now, this power is not miraculous working power. This power is more accurately represented as authority. We've come out of the authority of darkness. And as a consequence of coming out of the authority of darkness, we need another authority. He hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. You know, right here, 
we're in the jurisdiction of the Willimantic Police Department. But if you start walking in any given direction, within a relatively short period of time, you will cross a boundary where you have left the jurisdiction of the Willimantic Police Department, and you are now under the supervision of the state police. And they will be the ones who will respond if there's a call, because the Willimantic Police are not going out there that's outside their jurisdiction. He's talking about a change of jurisdiction. You were living under the authority of darkness. You were living under the authority of this world's system. But he brought you, he delivered you from that authority and brought you across a boundary in the spirit instead of a geographical boundary into the kingdom of his dear son, where your citizenship now is where your affiliation is, where your allegiance is. Now, let's stop over at 1 John chapter 2 for a moment. Are you still glad you came? I'm glad you came, frankly. In 1 John chapter 2, it declares to us in verse 15, Love not the world. Now, when he says love not the world, we're not talking about the people that are in the world. We're, again, talking about the systems and structures of the world, the way that the world is. Don't be loving the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Jesus said you can't serve two masters. If you're going to love God, then you can't be in love with the world. And if you're going to love the world, then you're kidding yourself if you tell yourself you love God. Because you don't get two lords, you get one. Isn't that what Jesus said? No man can serve two masters? It's got to be one. And if you think God's sharing time on the throne of your life with something, I'm going to tell you that the something you think he's sharing with is what's on the throne. Then he continues at verse 16 and he says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. In verse 16 he's saying, the world's only got this in it. It's got the lust of the flesh, it's got the lust of the eyes, it's got the pride of life. That's what's in the world. That's what the world system is built around. That's what its structures are are designed based on the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. We could spend a long time talking about these things, but we're just going to spend a few moments reminding ourselves of what we're talking about. The lust of the flesh is talking about actual physical desires of some sort. There's things, have you ever been sitting, working at a, a, a desk or something, and your tummy tells you it's time to go get something to eat? That's a desire of the flesh speaking to you. You didn't need to see a picture of a cheeseburger. You got something happening here. There's all kinds of things that your flesh will tell you you need. Most of them are lies. (laughs) You don't need them. Certainly not now. Now you're not sure you're glad you came this morning. But he says, not, now understand, he didn't say God doesn't allow your, that's not the point. The point is the systems and structures of the kingdom of God are not built on the desires of your flesh. But the world, yes. It builds systems around the idea that your flesh will speak to you, that your flesh will drive you. It's got quiet out here. You, you do recognize, uh, this, we're, we're, we're going to take a momentary side trip into an analogy. We're not describing the lust of the flesh. We're describing something which is like the lust of the flesh to give us the picture. You understand that in a household, a multi-generational type household, like, for instance, parents and children of different ages, that in many ways the youngest children are to that household 
what the flesh is like to this household. The most impulsive, the most rudimentary advertisers target children. Now, think this through with me for a moment. How much disposable income do children under five have? So you're giggling, which suggests to me that you get the point that they, generally speaking, they are not big contributors to our economy. So why is an advertiser who needs somebody to pay big money targeting little children? Because they understand that little children influence the people who have access to the big money. And the systems of this world are many of them built and designed to appeal to the desires of the flesh because although the desires of the flesh don't make the decisions, they have some influence over the person who does make the decisions. And the, in the same way that advertisers would like your four-year-old to decide what your brand loyalty is, the world would like your flesh to decide what your behaviors will be. Then we've got the lust of the eyes. That takes us a step outside of just what's happening inside of me. Now we're talking about things happening outside of me which appeal to me. You ever seen something that you didn't want till you saw it and then you wanted it? Again, there's four of you. <laughs> and they ask you to draw a picture of it. I just <laughs> had no notion that you wanted this thing until you see it. And now all of a sudden, whoa, that is exactly what I need. So much so that a minute ago you had no idea it existed. But now it's the thing you can't live without. That's the lust of the eyes. That's the way that works. This world is built on that. God's kingdom is not a kingdom of the impulses. And the pride of life, that arrogance that comes from thinking that it's about pleasing me, my life. You ever heard anybody say, it's my life? Yeah. Well, in the person-to-person -person sense, it's your life, not my life. But on the big sense, I would say that the Bible's theological position on that is that it's his life that you've been entrusted with. And it's not your life. That's the pride of life, which says, it's my life. It's my life. Do what I want. It's my life. Have you ever noticed that that usually comes up when somebody's about to do something intensely stupid? It's my life. Well, there'll be a day when you'll stand in front of a white throne, and I don't think that's what you're going to be saying. It was my life. I don't care what you thought about it. I liked it. You with me? There is something to reach for and something to avoid. Come on over to James chapter 4. Not a lot farther here, but we got a little more to go. Is God good? In the fourth chapter of the book of James... He says at the beginning of verse 4, you adulterers and adulteresses, but he's not speaking of that in the literal sense probably. If we looked at the context, we'd understand that better. Obviously, there's a possibility that this is a literal statement. But I think it, viewed as a whole, we understand that all across the Bible, adulterers and adulteresses is a figure for spiritual adultery, people who are honoring something other than God with their lives. And certainly all over the Old Testament prophets, God uses the figure of adultery as an image of our fickleness towards him. And here in this context, as we read a little farther, I think we're going to realize that he's talking about our single-minded attention to God. Now, 
the end of chapter 3, he's talking about the wisdom from above as compared with the wisdom which is not from above, which is earthly, sensual, and devilish, he says. Then as we begin chapter 4, he's talking about what happens in the earth because people don't connect with the wisdom from above, but instead connect with the wisdom which is not from above. And he says at verse 4, by way of of something of a remedy, You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Now the word that we're translating friendship there is from the Greek word phileo. It's talking about fondness. Having a fondness for the world, being attracted to the world. We're not talking about a covenantal friendship. You are my friend. I will come to your rescue. Count on me wherever you are. You know, sometimes we're trained to see friend. Friend is a covenant word. Well, in this case, we're not talking about a covenantal relationship. We're talking about attractiveness. A fondness for the world is an enmity for God. I can't hold these two ideas simultaneously. I'm crazy about God but I sure do like the world. These are incompatible thoughts. One of them is not the truth. And he says, if you're going to have that sort of fondness for the world, then you are at odds with God. And he takes it a little farther. He says, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And the word, which goes by very quickly in the English, looks almost like it it could have been dropped out of the sentence. It wouldn't make a difference. Is will. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world. But the word emphasizes our choice, a conscious choice. It's It's a powerful word in the Greek for a reasoned choice. He's saying, if you choose fondness for the world, You have chosen to be an enemy of God. That takes us back to Romans 12, too. Don't be conformed to this world. Don't decide to like being mushed by this world into what the world says you ought to be. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let God work His mighty work in us. Is this coming through? This isn't a, we, we, there's no way to dabble in this thing. There's, there's no partial with this. Made you a really nice beef stew. Got a little comet in it. But I stirred it pretty good. I don't think you'll notice. At beef stew, you had me. Comet sounds like a really bad idea. <laughs> and... The beef stew smells so very good that I'm almost thinking maybe it was so little comet it isn't going to be a problem. But just because you told me that, I'm thinking maybe no. Maybe I don't want any. It doesn't take much comet to ruin a vat of beef stew for me. And if we think we're mixing conformity to the world with transformation from the inside, we're mistaken. Because once you put a little conformity to the world into anything, what you've got is conformity to the world. No matter what you started with, no matter how good it looked before you added conformity to the world in it. Are we still here? He says, Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God, Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now let's go back to to Romans chapter 12. So what's the great challenge here in Romans chapter 12? It's a plea. It's a plea to let our bodies be available for the Lord's service. To answer the call of the Spirit. To walk in obedience. To not be conformed and pressed by this world. It pushes. It does. The minute that you tell yourself, that's it, I'm done being fond of this world. Boy, the world dresses itself up and asks you to be fond again, doesn't it? This time with milk chocolate frosting.
There's a pressure. But don't let the pressure form you and shape you. The Play-Doh can't resist me. But I'm not Play-Doh. I've been made by the Lord God Almighty in His image and for His glory. I've been born of His Spirit and I'm ruled by His Son. And I don't have to cave to that pressure. Plato doesn't have a choice, but I'm not Plato. I've been made something of value. And as a response to the privilege of having been made something of value, I want to honor the God who made me by showing that I value Him with the choices I make and the way that I live. Is this coming through? Be not conformed by, to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And now the last part of verse 2, that you may prove, prove meaning to test and to demonstrate. This is our call, to test and to demonstrate what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Our lives are supposed to be tests which demonstrate the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There's supposed to be an illustrated sermon so that when somebody wants to know what it would look like to live in the light, you'd say, well, check him out, check her out, check them out. When somebody wants to know what freedom looks like, what would freedom be? You can say, I'm free. When somebody wants to know what joy is about or what you mean by the peace of God, Instead of trying to find some way to, 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 to find the right words, we ought to be able to say, come with me. Come with me. We're called to submit our bodies as living sacrifices so that we can prove, that we can test and demonstrate what is God's good and perfect and acceptable will. Not so that we'll be received of him. That got settled early. That's the blood of Jesus. I'm not trying to do his will so that he will accept me. I'm trying to do his will because it, it demonstrates his goodness and his nature to those who have not accepted the forgiveness that is ours in Jesus Christ. It testifies of the release that's available for those who will come out of the darkness into the light for those who will come out of the power of Satan into the kingdom of God, for those who will come out of the unforgiveness into the forgiveness, for those who will come out of being strangers and aliens to the covenants of God to being joint heirs with Jesus Christ. It's a call. It's a cry. It's a testimony that there is a God in heaven who is worth all that we can give and then some. And the service that we provide to him is not a payment for what he's done, but it's an honor to give it. And it brings to us life and life more abundantly. Peace, joy, righteousness in unparalleled measure. Is that an amen moment?